Fantastic. Um, again, thank you. This is uh, thank you for joining. This is introduction to protocols.io. I'm Lenny Tatelman. I am the CEO and co-founder of protocols.io. I'm a scientist by training. And uh, it's my pleasure to do this webinar uh, today. There are three scientists on our team. We all alternate who does which one. Um, so today I have the pleasure. Before we jump into the webinar itself, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, as I said, we are recording this. We'll send you a link to the video and the slides uh, that I'm showing. So you have uh, all of the links and don't need to try to scribble down during the webinar itself. Um, there will be plenty of time for Q&A at the end, and I'll make sure to stick around. Um, but as we go along, if something that I'm presenting raises questions, which is ideal, and that's what we hope, um, please use the Q&A button uh, in the Zoom panel uh, at the bottom of your screen. Use the Q&A button to put in your questions, and we'll get to them um, in the Q&A part. Um, keep in mind that I will not be able to go over all of the uh, cool features and functionality in protocols.io. We have other webinars, so this is an introductory one. If you've already been using protocols.io for a while, um, you should check out our advanced uh, webinars, which we also run monthly. And if you have a question as you're using the system, or if you already have one and need a dedicated 10 minutes um, to go over something in the editor specific to your protocol, um, you can always go to slash help slash demo on protocols.io and book a one-on-one -on -one session um, where you connect by Zoom for a 30 minute or shorter um, as needed session to ask a question, share the screen. And that's at a time, day and time that you choose during the week. So hopefully, um, all of these resources will provide the things that you need. And today, um, I'll talk a little bit about why I co-founded Protocols.io, what our mission is, why we exist, and then give a introduction to our mission and some of the key functionality, and then we'll go over uh, some important things uh, if you're new to the platform in terms of how to share the protocols that you're creating, privately or publicly, um, how to publish them if you're in academia, um, and some of the ways to um, easily get existing protocols into protocols.io if you've been using Word, Google Docs, Electronic Lab Notebook, whatever other tool you've been using before protocols. Um, we'll talk about ways of quickly getting those existing protocols into protocols.io. So um, as I said, uh, I'm a scientist by training, and um, I, I should share that it was my postdoctoral research experience after I got my PhD in genetics. Uh, I did both experimental and computational biology, and it was during my postdoctoral experience in the Boston area in the United States where I spent the first year and a half of my postdoc um, correcting just one step of the research protocol that I was using. So instead of a microliter of an enzyme, I needed five. Instead of a 15 minute incubation with that chemical, I needed one hour. And at the end of that year and a half, I realized this is not a new method. It's not a new technique. It's a correction of something previously published. So that means I don't get any credit for this year and a half. Uh, it's not a new paper, not a new technique, it's a correction. And everyone else who's using this same protocol is getting misleading single cell microscopy results and has to spend a year or two rediscovering the little simple tweak uh, because there is no easy way to share updates to protocols once we've published the paper. And so I became obsessed with creating a central place to exchange this knowledge and keep the protocols up to date. But my story, sort of pushing my story aside, 
Um, there are many examples on social media and elsewhere of researchers complaining about the difficulty of finding details of published experiments. And uh, here is on the left-hand side, there is a tweet from a uh, postdoc uh, at the University of California, uh, I believe uh, Riverside, who says, I'm looking for a protocol in a 97 paper as described in 96, finds 96 paper as described in 87, finds 87 paper and it's paywalled. And it's a common and frustrating experience. This one is from a physicist. Uh, the one over here is from a physicist. The one on the left is from a biologist. The one on the right is from a physicist who is reading papers and the method sections are saying devices were fabricated as previously described, previously described, previously described, and the original reference says devices were fabricated with conventional methods. So I have a long, long list of where I bookmarked, uh, where I bookmark complaints just like this on Twitter. Um, it would take us the entire webinar to go over them. We won't, but I do want to point um, to a more quantitative analysis of this problem where uh, the initiative called Cancer Biology, Re Biology Reproducibility Project, um, which was a one and a half million dollar grant for the Center for Open Science and the company called Science Exchange to independently try to repeat key experiments from 50 cancer biology papers from top journals. And uh, when the first results of that initiative came out, there was a lot of media attention to it and Nature News and Vox. And in the Atlantic, um, one of my favorite science writers, Ed Young, uh, wrote, the hardest part by far was figuring out exactly what the original labs actually did. Scientific papers come with method sections that theoretically ought to provide recipes for doing the same experiments. But often those recipes are incomplete, missing out important steps, details, or ingredients in some cases, the recipes are not described at all. Researchers simply cite an earlier study that used a similar technique. And so this just reinforces what we saw on the previous slides um, in terms of individual uh, complaints about published papers. But what I find particularly revealing about this whole initiative is that the problem is not just in the published papers and the method sections of published papers, but when uh, the researchers leading this project actually contacted the individual academic labs that published the papers and try to collaborate and find the exact protocol that was used, even when reaching out to those labs, it was very difficult to do that. So here's a summary of the entire initiative where they said that uh, this is the Center for Open Science uh, that was co-leading the study. And they said 0% of protocols were completely described in the published papers. But as I said, even when they contacted the researchers that published the papers, those couldn't always find the exact protocols corresponding to what was in the paper. And so the entire effort had to stop not at 50, but at just 18 out of those uh, 50 papers that they were trying to replicate. And this whole thing highlights not just how hard it is to understand what was done from reading the method section of a paper, if you're trying to build an ad and follow up, but it highlights that long before we publish, there is a challenge of keeping our protocols organized. Um, and it's what I call not just external reproducibility of what is in the paper, but there is a much earlier issue challenge with internal reproducibility in our companies, at our biotechs, inside our research uh, teams in academia, where um, long before we're publishing, we're not doing a good enough job of organizing and tracking exactly which version and um, what, what state of the protocol and the details um, in one coherent place. And so the mission of 
protocols.io based on this is simply to make it easier to share these method details before, during, and after publication. So protocols.io is a place where you can collaborate with colleagues as you're doing the work. And then it makes it easier when you're publishing to share the detailed protocols. And we'll talk a little bit more during the uh, webinar about this. And after you've published it, as I'll show in the live demo in a moment, um, after you've published it, it's a place that you can come back to and share corrections and optimization. So that's our mission. And at a snapshot, um, we launched in 2014. There are two sides to protocols.io. There is the public side. If you're sharing protocols publicly, it is always free. It is open access, CC by license. It's free to read and free to share. And our business model is if you're using protocols.io in private mode within your research team, within your lab, within your company, that is the part that we charge for. So if you're sharing knowledge publicly, it's free. If you're using it internally, that's the side we charge for. So we launched in 2014. And as you can see at this point, there are just over 14,000 public protocols on protocols.io and over 55,000 private ones in uh, researchers' accounts. And I'm going to switch out of the slides very soon and actually demo the website. But before I do that, I wanted to mention, um, I wanted to mention that there are um, at this point, uh, not in 2014 when we launched, but as of today, there are hundreds of uh, journals that actually encourage and recommend using protocols.io and author guidelines when you submit a paper. There are more and more funders in the United States and outside um, that recommend um, or even require sometimes uh, their grantees to share protocols and they recommend protocols.io. And there are more and more universities around the world that have site licenses. Um, I'll mention a little bit more about them, but uh, there are more and more universities. Uh, some of you on this call might be uh, at a school that has a site license. So I'll say a few words uh, during the webinar for those of you who do, but these site licenses make protocols.io free, not just for public use, but for unlimited private use for research and teaching uh, at the university. And um, with that, I will exit out of the slides. There we go. And I wanted to navigate to the welcome page. So um, for public protocols, you don't need to sign in. Um, you can always, if you've shared something on protocols.io, everyone can access it. They don't, if you've shared it publicly, uh, no, you don't need an account. You, can, you don't need to register and sign in. You can just uh, access the protocols. But of course, for keeping your own protocols um, for that, you can sign in with Orchid, with the Gmail. Um, it's very easy to create an account and sign in. It is free um, for limited private use and then free for unlimited public sharing. And so we're going to go to one of the 14,000 public protocols as an example. But do keep in mind that while I'm showing a public protocol, by default, if you create an account, if you've signed in, Every protocol that you create is going to be private. It's only visible to you. You decide who to share it with, which individuals, what permissions to give to them. Uh, is it view only or view and share? So all of that is under your control. And making it public like this example, that's something that you decide in agreement with your co-authors, with your colleagues, with your supervisor. Um, and so if and when you're ready, you can uh, get credit for your work and publish your protocol. But by default, everything starts out privately. Um, and I want to highlight that these are not static 
PDFs. Um, it's not just text files. So the protocols and protocols.io, you can export a PDF, but the protocols are uh, dynamic and interactive. So you can add videos into steps of the protocols. Um, you could take your phone into the cold room. You can show exactly how you're preparing a sample. You can shoot a 30 second video or a minute, however long you need, and upload it directly into the step of the protocol, which helps a lot for reproducibility and visual details that we sometimes fail to capture just in words. And you should also notice um, that when I mouse over different steps, I am able to click plus to right here and ask a question about a protocol. So you can see on step seven, there are seven comments. And if you ask a question, that will go to the author. It'll go to everyone who's using and has bookmarked this protocol. And you can start to have step level conversations um, around the protocol. Of course, if your protocol is private, um, that discussion happens only with the people that you've shared the protocol with, members of the same uh, team or what you call workspace. Um, and if it's public, when you ask a question, you decide whether to ask uh, publicly or to ask in a private mode. So that is something that um, is under your control. But in essence, what this does is it creates a sort of FAQ, frequently asked questions, right on the steps of the protocol. So this way you don't have to if you've published the protocol, you don't have to answer the same question over and over by email to different people. The discussion happens right on the step. You can point people to the answer. People ideally over time discover uh, the answer and don't even have to ask you because the FAQ is right on the protocol, even though it can happen months or years uh, after you published it. And one of the nice features is that when I talk about, when I mentioned that you can keep things up to date um, long after you've published them, one of the nice things you'll see is that um, as the owner of a protocol, as an author, you can easily create a new version. So if people are asking you questions and you realize that something that you uh, put into a protocol is unclear, um, not only can you answer those questions right on the step, but you can create a new version. So you can see here we're looking at version two. The previous version does not disappear, but you can update the protocol. And then if you click the more button, um, you'll see that you have the ability to click compare. And with a click of a button, you can see what is the same and what's different between the newer version and the original. Um, you can see which steps are the same and highlighting for the steps that are different. Um, so you can see there's something different in step two. Steps three through eight are the same. And then again, some differences uh, in step nine. So this gives a very quick identification to what has changed between the versions. And when I say that things are dynamic and interactive, Another really nice thing is that there is a copy fork button that allows you to use every, whether it's private or public protocol, to use everything you see on protocols.io on yours or publicly shared um, by others. You can use it as a template. So if I click copy fork, I create a clone, a copy of this protocol that is mine, and then I get the edit button and um, if you're working with liver tissue and I'm working with lung tissue, we might have slight tweaks and differences between our protocols. And so I can take your liver protocol, make a copy for the lung uh, samples that I work with and make modifications uh, as needed. And if and when I'm ready to share it publicly, I can do that and the same compare functionality that I just showed between versions also works between the original and uh, any forks off of it. And we make it very clear what's original, what's a fork. Um, you can see that the protocols have a fork tab 
Forks tab where we show um, the evolution of the protocol and we try to give credit both to the original authors and to the people that are sharing uh, optimizations for different uh, equipment, for different uh, use cases. So both of the people that are sharing the fork and the original authors um, get credit for that sharing. Of the 14,000, one of the last things that I wanted to show on the protocol level um, is that out of the 14,000 public protocols that we have, I think maybe five to 10% uh, of the protocols are uh, computational pipelines, bioinformatics protocols, but the vast majority are hands-on uh, wet lab and field uh, techniques. And for those, I want to highlight um, what we call the run functionality. So this is something that allows you uh, kind of like a cooking checklist. This is something that allows you to uh, step through the protocol on your uh, tablet, iPad, Samsung tablet, on your phone or laptop um, to see where you are, what step you're doing next. So you can say I'm done with uh, step two, I'm going on to step three. If there is a timer, you can start it in the fume hood right on your phone. Um, and you have a record of when exactly you perform this step. And very importantly, if you change anything as you're doing the experiment, you can click the edit button and say, today I used four microliters instead of five. And then when you save it, um, you have a record of exactly how you ran that protocol, how you did that experiment on that particular day. So it creates a sort of electronic lab notebook record. You can keep it in protocols.io. You can export it and put it into whatever electronic lab notebook um, you might be using, um, but you have a record of exactly how you ran the protocol on that uh, particular day. All right. Um, so with that, I am going to switch out of the protocol level view. Um, we'll do just maybe a couple more minutes of the live demo. And then we'll move, uh, soon we'll move into the Q&A. And I can see some questions are already starting. So if you have other questions, don't hesitate to put them in. But now I'm switching from the protocol view into my file manager in protocols.io. So this is what we call a workspace. It's kind of like the file manager in your computer. And if you have an account, if you've created an account, you'll have a workspace that you create. And when you sign in, this is where you will typically be taken on protocols.io. This is where you can create folders and subfolders organize all of the different protocols and collaborate with your colleagues. If you invite them, if you've created a workspace, you can invite them into the workspace and then you don't have to share protocols one by one. Um, but everyone who is part of the same workspace um, has access to all of the folders and all of the protocols that are shared in there. Um, I do want to highlight I, I do want to point out that if you've been invited into an existing workspace, you'll see whatever the folder structure is there, but you'll also see a little folder with your name and the, our company Raccoon logo. That's your private space. So any protocols that you put in here are visible only to you. Um, and you would have to move the protocol into the parent space for other people to be able to access it. So this is your private folder um, right here and only the protocols shared in the main space are visible to others if you have more than one member in the workspace. And one of the things you'll see, so this is where the protocols are organized um, and there are a lot of administrative tools. We won't be able to go through everything, but one of the things you'll notice is that um, there are protocol records. So this is, uh, if I click plus, I can create a new protocol. Um, 
in one of these folders or a collection of related protocols. But you'll also notice, so those would look like this, but you'll also notice that in addition to individual protocols, there is a PDF file here. And I want to, that might not be obvious, but when you click new, um, you can actually add Excel files, PDF files, existing protocols very quickly into a workspace. Um, you can add a folder, um, compressed folder, a zip folder with many different files. So it's a little bit like Dropbox in that sense. And the reason it's important is because if you have existing protocols, for example, there are, let's imagine there are 30 existing protocols that your research group uses, and you don't have the time to put every one of them in um, at a, you know, using the protocols IO editor. Um, what you can do very quickly is click new and upload all of those PDFs, or you just drag and drop into here from your computer's file manager. And um, it's not perfect sharing, but in 10 seconds, you can take all of your existing protocols, put them into a central place that all of your teammates and collaborators can access them. Um, and while it doesn't take the full advantage of the dynamic and interactive nature of protocols.io and the beautiful editor that we've built specifically for capturing the important details of research protocols, um, it is, while imperfect, it is a very quick way to get protocols right in um, in just a couple of seconds. However, if you have a little bit more time, let's say one or two minutes per existing protocol, um, what I actually recommend instead of just dr dragging in a PDF, I recommend creating a new protocol. Uh, here's a test one. Going into the editor, and this, again, this is for existing protocols. Going into the editor and uh, this is a test uh, that I have going into the editor and maybe don't even bother entering specific steps and beautiful components, um, but just give it a title, go to the description tab, write a short abstract of what this technique is, and then if you scroll down, you can attach a file. So attach your PDF of an existing protocol to this record. And the reason for doing it is that, yes, it takes you an extra 30 to 60 seconds to create a protocol like this, but then they're easy to find. If you have 30 protocols inside different uh, folders of your workspace and maybe inside different workspaces for different projects. When you do a search for a particular protocol, um, we can't search your PDF, but if you created a protocol and added your PDF as attachment, we can search the title, we can search the keywords, we can search the abstract of the protocol that you created. So you'll make it a little bit easier for yourself and your collaborators to find the right protocols if you at least add them as attachments. And the last thing that I wanted to say uh, regarding existing protocols is that if you're in the editor, so I'm going into edit mode, when you go into the uh, steps section, our protocol. Of course, you can add text and components um, directly, but I want you to notice that if you have an existing protocol over here at the bottom, there is a button to insert steps from a text file. So from Word, from PDF, you can actually copy paste uh, from an existing protocol. Um, so imagine that I copy pasted it in here. I say each number is a step and then it will pull 
those steps that you pasted in, it will pull them right into the protocol so that you don't have to copy paste them one at a time. So these are quick ways uh, to get existing protocols into protocols.io if you're just getting started. And before I finish, finally, um, I wanted to say that we also have editorial support um, where if you have an existing protocol, you can actually go to protocols.io slash reenter protocols. There is a link to it from the slides. And there, if you're signed in, you can just upload a PDF. Um, this is something that we charge for. So uh, if you don't have a site license, we charge $50 to $100 for a typical uh, protocol, depending on how long and complicated it is. But one of our editors will put it in, another editor will check to make sure there are no errors and will then privately transfer it to you. So um, if you need if you need the support um, and don't have the time uh, to put in the protocol fully yourself, we do have uh, the ability to help and I did want to say a quick word um, for those who are at a university that does have a site license for protocols.io. So if you go to protocols.io slash institutions, um, you can find the link to it in the footer of protocols. You can find it in the slides. Um, what you'll notice in the middle of the page is uh, this space where you can click on the drop down of all the universities that have uh, a campus wide subscription to protocols.io. So uh, you can navigate here. You can check if your university has a site license. And if it does, the import that I just showed is actually included. So um, if you have a premium license through your organization, you can actually send a protocol through uh, that portal that I just showed, um, you can send it to our editorial team and we'll help to put it in. And then it's uh, for free if there is a site license. And um, there are a few more things uh, in the slides, going back to the slides. Um, I've gone over most of the functionality, but I did want to say that um, before you share something publicly for every protocol, of course, you can invite people into the same workspace, but every single protocol has a share button. And that allows you to share the protocol by email with a specific individual, with one or more people and decide what permissions they have. And this same share button, if you click it at the top, you'll see private link, um, you're always able to grab a private link to your protocol to share it with editors, reviewers, if you're submitting the protocol for publication, if you're an academic. So you have um, many different ways of sharing uh, on protocols.io. And then I did want to say that um, if you are using protocols.io as you do the research, um, because there are many journals that recommend protocols.io for improving the reproducibility of your manuscript, um, it makes it really easy to click publish on protocols.io, get a DOI for your protocol, and add it to the method section um, of your paper. So here's an example of a plus biology paper. And if you navigate to the materials and methods, at the top of it, it says the detailed methods and protocols, media preparations, et cetera, are available as a collection in protocols.io. So I don't have time to go over collections now, but I just wanted to say that um, we have a very easy way to create a sort of container of 10, however many protocols you need that accompany your paper. You get a single DOI that you can cite for the collection and you can steer people to all of the protocols uh, that are accompanying the published uh, manuscript. Um, 
And if you have new versions, we'll guide people. If you come back and you're sharing corrections or optimizations, if people from the research paper click on your protocol, we will always let them know uh, if there is a newer version that you've updated uh, and we'll guide them to that. And the last thing I wanted to say is that there is a new partnership we have with the journal Plus One, where they've created a new article type called Lab Protocols that is specifically, so again, this is for academics. If you are in a biotech or pharmaceutical, you're unlikely to be publishing your protocols in this manner. But if you're in academia and you're sharing protocols publicly, um, you can now actually get them peer-reviewed in Plus One and make it a peer-reviewed open access paper that is going to be um, a full peer-reviewed publication that counts in your CV. And we're starting to see more and more scientists who are clicking submit to Plus One um, from their protocol. And we, of course, uh, encourage you to, uh, again, there'll be a link to this uh, from the slides, but we encourage you to take a look at some of the lab protocols that have already been published uh, since we launched this initiative um, back two years ago, I think, uh, with PLUS One, but that's um, an additional uh, way to get uh, credit for your method development, All right? And I did want to make sure that we have time for q and I've gone over the import service. And so I will stop there. I think there are already some comments in the Q&A. So I'll take a look and um, reminder that we have other webinars. And if there are things that we don't get to in the questions today, if you have questions anytime down the road, if you're joining this webinar late, um, this is an important link slash help slash demo that lets you book a one on one uh, session where you can ask questions, get demo, and look at particular elements of protocols.io um, that I'm unable to cover today. So, with that, I am going to pause and take a look at what we have in the QA. So there is a uh, good question. There is a good question um, from one of the attendees. And the question is, um, my university subscribes to Springer Nature experiments. Uh, can you share what is common and what is different between Springer protocols and protocols.io? Thank you. So. Um, Excellent question. Um, it is true that there are a lot of, uh, not just Springer, but there are a lot of uh, journals uh, dedicated now to protocol sharing. There is uh, Springer Protocols, uh, Nature Protocols. Elsevier has a journal called Methods X. There's Journal of Visual Experiments, Cell Press has more um, and more. They've launched several uh, journals dedicated to protocol sharing. And those are, I would say, similar to what I mentioned about PLOS One, a way to peer review a protocol. Um, but Protocols.io is open access. And I think it's important, you know, I'm very glad that uh, whoever asked the question did so. It's important to realize the distinction. We are not a journal. We do not peer review your protocol. If you're sharing on Protocols.io, if you're sharing on Protocols.io, um, we will look at every public protocol every day um, to take out spam, to take out pseudoscience, but we are not a journal that does peer review, right? So the difference between Springer protocols and Protocols.io is that Protocols.io is a rapid way to share when you're um, maybe as part of publishing a research paper, maybe independently, but it is more like Dropbox or Google Docs just dedicated to protocols with functionality um, for capturing all of the details that you need. 
Um, but it is not a journal. We don't peer review. And if you've shared on protocols.io, you're still very welcome to then publish it in lab protocols or in one of the Springer journals or anywhere else um, as appropriate. Um, we've never had a case of a scientist sharing on protocols.io and then uh, a journal saying, oh, you cannot publish it now because it's already on protocols.io. Uh, journals know that we are different. We are a sharing platform, kind of like GitHub for sharing code. Just because you've shared the code uh, on GitHub doesn't mean that you can't write uh, a bioinformatics paper about it for an appropriate journal. And then the next question is, what is the benefit of sharing the protocol in terms of citation and recognition? So another great question. Um, I'm still sharing the screen. So let's go back to an example of a public protocol. And you will see that every public protocol on protocols.io has a metrics tab. Um, so we try to share everything we know in terms of recognition and credit that scientists get. You know, this really is at the heart of protocols.io. We want you to get credit. Um, sometimes something that should have taken you a week takes a month or six months to get to work. And we want you to get credit for what is frequently just one or two sentences in a published paper. If you spent a long time getting something to work, you should get credit for it. And other people are probably struggling with the exact same modifications. So um, we want you to help each other. And for every protocol, we share how many people are looking at it, how many people are exporting. And um, you will know on your own protocols, we send you every month an email telling you how many people are looking um, and using your protocol. You'll have the ability to see what kind of engagement and reuse there is on your protocol um, on the metrics tab. And if we see that your protocol is being cited in published papers, we will add it to the metrics tab. So you will know when it's downloaded, when it's reused, when people are making forks of it um, and reusing it. So hopefully it helps um, you know, the, the reason to share publicly on protocols.io is if you're doing it as part of publishing a research paper, it makes your research paper easier for someone else to reproduce. Hopefully there are more citations to your research paper. Um, and you can bump into collaborators this way. We have some scientists who say that um, by sharing on protocols.io, um, they build links in the community. It's like going to a conference by answering questions on their protocols. They find collaborators. They find people that uh, connect with them because they're trying to use the technique and then they end up collaborating, publishing papers together. So it's a way to grow your network and um, all the protocols, 60% of our traffic to the public protocols comes from Google searches. So they're visible in Google searches. Uh, Google Scholar recently added uh, the public protocols of protocols.io. So um, your work is discoverable. And even if protocols.io is not um, a formal journal, because we're a platform, like I said, it is a way to get more credit um, for the protocols that you have. And it's very easy to share, unlike, you know, the months or years that it can take to actually publish um, a research paper. And we are at 45 minutes exactly. Um, so if there are no burning questions, I'm going to stop the recording, but I can hang out for a little bit more. If you have any other questions, I would be happy to answer them.